A security company official has described how a one-year-old girl and the family's domestic worker were beaten by criminals as they robbed the Randberg home. The next thing, they pull out guns. There's two of them and another two come in and there's nothing you can do about it. He broke into a house, a shack, and then stole TVs, he stole some house equipment, house appliances. Crime tends to happen when people are relaxed in their home environment. I've had burglaries, I've had a car stolen, I've had smash and grabs. Three men have been arrested after a shootout with police in Pretoria. They were apprehended after exchanging fire with police officials on the R21. Now there's been a lot of focus how in Johannesburg people are making their areas safe and it has been referred to as vigilantism. Well certainly we would like to see these people behind bars. My vision of South Africa is to see a young girl walking alone in the middle of the night without fear of being attacked. With one of the highest rates of violent crime in the world, South Africans are dealing with the repercussions of living in a country where they feel they're at the mercy of criminals and the police cannot protect them. In one of Johannesburg's oldest suburbs, Security specialist Dave Thomas arrives to install an alarm system in a newly renovated home. The former owner was murdered here last year. How's the fence going? There are many security companies in South Africa. There's a huge demand for security and it's become a very big growth business. This is what we call an outdoor passive. When you are at home and you're bathing your kids or you're having a shower, you want these outdoor passives on so that you've got a second line of defense. And then if somebody does happen to come through your electric fence, your passives are here as a backup to them. Like many suburbs in Johannesburg, Kensington has been hard hit by crimes ranging from burglaries, hijackings and armed robberies to murder in the last few years. The police are battling to maintain law and order, and people try to protect themselves by adding extra security to their homes. Clearly we are filling a vacuum that is left by the police. There just are not enough police to do their job. Thank you very much. The idea is not just about selling, selling hardware in this business, it's about actually educating people about crime and in, in encouraging people to be as proactive as possible. It's actually quite unbelievable how many electric fences in Johannesburg are not properly maintained, and criminals know this. And if you've arrived home and you haven't put in your beams, you can get a, a nasty surprise can be lurking you know, around the corner. Generally, you're going to get a call from people once, once the incident has taken place, which is a very reactive approach. So we'll often get called in the early morning hours or late in the evening when there's been an incident, and then people feel the need to have this type of security put in. Coming into the, the living area, you'll see this has all, all got burglar bars on it. And should, for whatever reason, somebody get in through the bars, there is an indoor passive. We have a, a gate here that's installed here, um, a security gate, as an added protection in, in terms of the bedroom section, because when you're sleeping at night, the sensors in your rooms are not armed. You can hear the, the sirens going off, they're just testing the siren for the, for the electric fence. That's the type of noise that you make. You get different sirens. You can have two sirens in your premises. One can make a different noise for your fence and your alarm so you know which one is going off. I would prefer to do something else, but, but unfortunately, it also you, you realize that this is where South Africa is and there's a need for, for people to be protected. Cahill has lived in Kensington for 22 years and has seen crime escalate over time and the effect this has had on the people in her community. It's got a very peaceful feeling, but to some extent that's deceptive. We've had to really adapt to the crime situation here. 
comes in. Obviously, I've had my own direct experiences of crime. And it's an irony to say that, well, they're quite minor compared to what other people have experienced. I've obviously had all the usual things. I've had burglaries, I've had a car stolen, I've had smash and grabs. Very late at night, in fact, on one occasion, which was very scary for me because I was on my own. I've had people try to open my door, my car door, uh, late at night. I've had a number of intrusions on my property. On one occasion, um, actually apprehended a guy climbing over the wall with an axe. But I think what's affected me more is my exposure to very, very violent crime amongst the people that are close to me and that I really care for. Friends have been raped. Two were raped at knife point repeatedly throughout the night. A third had taken her two young children to nursery school, was returning to her home with her young 11-month-old, and there were four robbers in the house, and they again raped her in front of her child. My grandmother's elderly neighbor was raped and murdered. Her eyes were gouged out and she was left to bleed to death. And very shortly after that, her husband was murdered in his shop. In response to increasing crime, Patrick Murphy patrols the streets of his community in an effort to monitor and stop incidents occurring. Residents are free to call on him in any crisis situation. I've been shot at on numerous occasions. In my other vehicle, I actually took a, I took a nine mil round through the passenger door, shattered my window. So this shop here, there was Six guys came in a maroon caravel and tried to rob the shop two days ago, three days ago, in the middle of the day. Um, yesterday morning there was a house breaking around the next corner here. Um, lucky the security guard here was pretty on the ball and actually got a registration on her. All right. Yes. How are you, man? I'm all right. That registration number yesterday. The middle letter, was it J or was it T? It's J. It's J, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Sharp man. All right. Street security guards are employed to patrol the neighborhood, oh, but their presence doesn't stop crime happening. But there was one attempted hijacking where a lady was shot, shot in the back and paralyzed. And I believe she's still in ICU. Um, so I'm not sure she's pulled through or not. But they say if she pulls through, she'll be paralyzed for life. Yeah, we're not going to see Elsie, who um, is a lady who's involved in the street committee on this section. And they're on their own little... We've got guards on the street here, their own security guards. They're employed to try and look after the streets. Around here, we've had... Obviously, we've had the hijacking down at Barry's. There was a gun shootout just on the corner down there. Um, about 20 bullets was going. We have had Clive here, just here, he got hijacked with a policeman who was in his civvies and in his police car, and he got hijacked here, just outside the house. We've had break-ins up on Somerset. We've had break-ins down here. I'm actually in the process of selling the house, and I'm packing up and I'm going because my kids have no freedom here. I'm going back to England. And I know England's got its problems as well, but in England, it's, it's a matter of if you get mugged, if you get hijacked. Over here, it's definitely a case of when. It's mid-morning. A woman arrives home from a shopping mall. Her security guard stands outside the gate to monitor her arrival. As the gate closes, it is ran by a car that has followed her home. The gang enters the property and robs the woman of her watch, mobile phone and jewellery.
They are gone in minutes. You know, perception is that the white people are the only ones that are crying about crime because they're in the suburbs. And in many regards, it's true because they are seen as being the ones who have got a lot. So they are the ones in the northern suburbs, etc., who are being targeted by the Rolex gang. They are being targeted for their vehicles, etc., for their material possessions. What people seem to forget is that most of the street robberies, most of the people who are actually victims of crime are actually black people in this country. And I don't think that their voice has been fully heard. They are as fed up with crime as probably more likely to be victims of crime than white people. We all agree, I think, that the nature of violent crime in South Africa is disturbing. And perhaps if we get greater understanding of why this happens, we will find solutions. We're chatting to Mary De Haas, Independent Researcher and Violence uh, Monitor. Good morning, Rudy. Thank you very much. And you're making the point that to make a link between crime and poverty and simply leaving, the, leaving it there is an oversimplification of a very complex issue. Tell us more of your thoughts. You can look all over the world in very poor societies and you won't necessarily find the levels of crime that we have. Poverty certainly plays a part, but so does policing, so does morality, so does socialization. The crime levels in black areas are appalling and often not dealt with as well as crimes in, in, in middle class areas. Mm. Mary, I'm glad you brought the race aspect of it because uh, I must confess, sometimes I get incandescent with anger because there would be comments that it's white people who are victims of crime. But right now, I don't have one single black friend who's never been robbed. I've been a victim of that myself. We're all victims of crime, regardless of the color of our skin. I suspect that whatever solution we have, we can recruit and train as many police officers as we are able to. But if we don't deal with the socioeconomic uh, challenges, I can't see any solution uh, working. While on patrol in Kensington, Patrick Murphy receives a call that there has been a shooting in a nearby street. He races to the scene to discover a pedestrian has been shot in an armed robbery. How are you doing there, buddy? How are you doing it? Uh, go here. Uh, attempted robbery. Two guys walking on the street. Two guys with firearms approached him and robbed him. Um, they shot this individual. There was five shots fired. I'm not sure how many shots were. Yeah, I'm not sure how many times he was he was hit. Uh, one suspect was arrested further up the road where he was hiding in some bushes, and then he started jumping over walls. He was found hiding in somebody's garage at the back. <laughs> Police continue to search for the second suspect. I'm glad to see a, gra a good pr uh, police presence so for a change. So. They wanted his cell phone. Now they can she say no. Now he start to shoot. Robbery every day. I'm scared. We are scared to go and buy some bread. So I don't like this place. It's not safe. And even the, during the day, you can't be relaxed. If you walk here, you can't relax because it's going to take you. You want cell phone and money and the jewelry only the time. We're not, no, no, we are not free, man. We are not free that in this place. Despite increases in the number of police in the country, violent crime and aggravated robberies have forced communities to come up with ways to deal with their particular problems. In Alexandra, a township with a history of violence and where half a million people live cheek by jowl, 
some concerned residents have joined the Community Policing Forum. One of their functions is to patrol the township on a regular basis, keeping an eye out for criminals and each other. Sibusisu Zikalala is head of the Alexandra Community Policing Forum. He is leading tonight's patrol. When we do our patrol, it's all about searching for weapons. We are doing this voluntary. Okay, there is no payment that goes on at the end of the month. We do this just out of our free will, wanting to see Alexandra improving. The community respects what we are doing, and they always tell us that, go ahead, guys, you're making the community safe. We are all here, we have sacrificed our time, we are here to work to save the community. We are going to work together as a team. Let's keep the pace. If all of us are on uniform, those guys will see us probably from a distance. Then if someone has a weapon, they will hide it and, and, and all that. So we try to keep the guys who are wearing uniform at the back and then those ones who are not in uniform in the front so that now people won't recognize us. We stand on the, at the corners and search people who are coming. Most people who are randomly stopped and searched are compliant. We go to the patrolling with a mentality of expect anything. Because at times you come across people who have weapons and you see that most of us are unarmed here. But by God's grace, we managed to apprehend those guys. Our presence at night and us having to patrol, sacrifice our time, it actually brings a difference. A few years back, during walk even 100 meters um, after 12 or after 10 for that matter, at night. But not everyone in Alex agrees with the methods used by the Community Policing Forum. We've got new members here. That's why some of us don't have the deck, the card like myself. I've got the card. They must make this thing to be a proper thing. They come, they identify themselves. Can we please search you? Then there's a corporation, you stand, they search you, then thank you, then they go. You don't just say, hey, wait, I want to search you. Then they are terrorizing the community. Move. The group come across a man they believe has been involved in a house robbery. They arrest him and call the police for backup. Apparently, he broke into a house, a shack, and then stole TVs, he stole some house equipment, house appliances, and took off and, and, and ran away. So what's happening now is that we have, to, we, we have taken him, we are still waiting for the van to come take him. Then he will be taken to the, to, to the station. For every person that is in South Africa, in fact in the whole world, to take the issue of safety into their own hands. It shouldn't be, it's their job. They are paid to do it. And so, yes, they are paid to do it, but also they need our help in order to, make, to, to, to do their job properly. A second man is found carrying ammunition. He will not respond when police ask him if he has a weapon. He is also taken back to the station for further questioning. We do get successes. That's why even the station support us and they respect us, because they see our importance of being here. The next morning in Kensington, the news breaks that a street security guard has been attacked while on night duty. He dies from his injuries two days later. Residents spontaneously begin to tie red ribbons around their trees to show their horror at the death of Clifford Bugatti.
At a residence association meeting not long after Clifford's death, an extraordinary number of people turn out to discuss Clifford's senseless murder and what to do about the issue of crime in their neighborhood. We're basically trying to get the community involved so that we stand as a united front so that we can fight crime. There's been a few deaths, there's been lots of robberies. It's close to our hearts to, to make sure that we look after our suburb and look after one another. This is the first time that I've come to a community meeting and actually have a, have a deep interest in what's happening around me. When I came to Kensington two years ago, there was a break-in into my property two times, so I was forced to hire private security. There was an attempt to hijack me. Uh, I have a bullet wound. That's the reason why I came tonight. The fact of the matter is that the police are not capable, or they're capable, but they're under-resourced and cannot protect us like we need them to. That's the fact of the matter. And they are doing their damnedest to try and fight the scourge of crime that we're dealing with, but they need help. I had people phoning this morning saying, I'm too scared to come out of my house. And I actually, I thought this is disgusting that we are <coughs> trapped in our own homes at night. No one walks their dogs, no one walks around, no one leaves their, their garden. So we are, we are trapped in our own homes. I'm based at the Total Data Center. We opened 24 hours. Our staff got mad, uh, you know, got, uh, get hijacked or get, uh, things get stolen from them when they knock off from there. In the evening, they're working in fear. We are under siege. <laughs> and you know what? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. You might not like your neighbor, <laughs> but your neighbor is going to save your life. A community can stop crime. So stand together, listen, look at the best options to such a problem, and fight crime, fight crime. Stand up and fight crime. Patrick Murphy presents his plan for tightening security in the suburb. I always ask we need to patrol the streets on a proactive basis rather than a reactive basis. So if we see suspicious vehicles, if we see suspicious people, we will follow those people, we will follow those vehicles until they leave the area. We've got about 4,000, maybe more than 4,000 houses in Kensington. Every house has got three or four or five people living in those houses. All of these are eyes that should be able to communicate to us and tell us what's happening, where it's happening, how it's happening. Maybe one night a week, say from four to six o'clock, we all decide, let's all go for a walk. Let's take our dogs for a walk. Let's take our kids with us. And we actually go out and we walk. These streets belong to us. On the other side of Johannesburg is the township of Tembisa, where Clifford Bugatti lived with his family before he was murdered. His widow Patience is struggling to support their two children since his death a few months ago. She now rents out part of her property to other family members to help make ends meet. Got two kids, one girl, one boy. Faith is in grade eight, and Leslie grade two. And my daddy is in Zimbabwe. My husband passed away. He was 37 years old. He was at work when he passed away. But he liked the job, but he was always saying, it's not safe. He wanted to leave that shop, but now he had to die before he even left it. <laughs> I was on my way to work. I was in a train. They found me and told me that he was shot. There were eight men who attacked him. They took his wallet, bulletproofing the car in his gun. I went to, to see him on Saturday morning. I found him in a, in a coma. So I was there the whole day. Till he passed away, I was with him. They should have taken what they wanted and live his life. Because now it's hard for us. Because with plans together, the kids, they are still young. So I just get angry with them. 
and I haven't heard anything from the police or anything from anyone else since he passed away. And the kids go to school. They need clothes, they need everything. It's now hard courses. It happened, I haven't bought them anything new. Now it's really, really hard. It's hard. Clifford built patients a small shop on their property, which they used to supplement his income. He used to keep the shop stocked for her, but now she battles to keep it open. It was big and full. <laughs> now it's empty. Small things I can manage to, but not big things. It's now hard. But I just say thank you to what I get. It's enough for us to eat. I get away with the clothes. The much sauce and everything. But I just wish that one day it will be normal again. As I used to live before, and I was still having my husband with me. Because life still continues. While Patience has heard nothing from the police regarding the investigation into Clifford's death, South Africans have heard a lot from their new police chief, Becky Kvele. He replaced the former commissioner who was convicted of corruption. Kvele has reverted to military titles and has been criticized for wanting to increase police powers. But while the country has one of the highest rates of violent crime in the world, it also has one of the highest rates of police mortality. Four weeks back, we buried Captain Skippers from our police station. You know why? He shouted three times to this thug. He said, drop the gun, drop the gun, drop the gun. What happened? The thug dropped our captain. We buried him. And police must stop doing those things. Anybody that is a thug has got the gun in the hand. Deadly force. <laughs> We must just understand that the season has changed. Somebody will have to define to me what is a human right. If you go and you rape a young woman, you rape a six-year-old, you rape an eleven-year-old, you kill the father, they get in the house, they rape the daughters, they shoot everybody, they go out, tell me what right that person has. Others fear his approach, believing that increasing police powers is not the answer to the problem the country faces. The number of civilians killed by police has increased by more than 25% over the previous year. This is a grenade for the riot control. This is a UMP. It's the new firearm. It's the one that I'm having now. It uses a 9mm round with this magazine. You can put in 30 rounds in the magazine. Bele's strong words have been backed up by an unprecedented media campaign to try to assure South Africans that there is a new sheriff in town who is declaring war on criminals. He has traveled the country in an effort to boost public confidence in his fight against crime. Here he drops in on shoppers and staff in a mall. Yeah. Yeah. Hi guys, how are you? How are you? Yeah. 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 Why are you closing when you see us? Yeah. Yeah. Because he's scary. Are yeah. you scared to see us? Yeah. Why? Because yeah. yeah. I've never yeah. seen so many police at once. What have you seen yeah. before? Yeah. Only criminals. Yeah. Crooks. Yeah. Not, yeah. yeah. Not today. Not yeah. today. Shopping malls are increasingly the target of armed robberies, often involving gangs of up to 20 men. We had very well-dressed gentlemen walking in, so my colleagues at the time thought it was, you know, good customers, well-dressed men. The next thing, they pull out guns. There's two of them, and another two come in, and there we go, we get hit, and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, everybody watches you being robbed, and they just walk out of here. So I think at this point in time, based on my personal experiences, I don't really have much faith, but I'm hoping that today's visit will make a difference.
In spite of public skepticism about the police's ability to tackle violent crime, Vele's determination seems unwavering, even though he himself admits the problem is a complex one. The brutality of the South African crime is what I say it goes beyond the criminal justice system. We need other ways, we need psychologists, we need sociologists to, to tell us what is supposed to happen in South Africa. While the trademark violence of South African crime cannot simply be accounted for by poverty, more people than ever now live below the breadline, desperate for jobs and better living conditions. As Patrick Murphy travels from Kensington to the adjacent industrial area of Doornfontein, he passes abandoned and neglected buildings. Some of these buildings, um, they're, they're no longer industrial buildings. People have put rooms inside them and, and put partitions across and made hundreds of rooms in these buildings where people live in these little rooms without windows. There are so many bad buildings, but there's just so much for, for council and government to do. These abandoned buildings are now being occupied by immigrants from other African countries and locals from the poorer provinces who have flocked to the city in the hope of finding work. can't be right. It's, again, it's a place for criminals to hide out when the building's abandoned like that. Nobody's got control over that building. There are people living there under those conditions that, that can't be right. The lack of basic services and housing, coupled with increasing unemployment and widespread corruption, has given rise to more and more public protests across South Africa, which are turning increasingly violent as frustration mounts. The truck came and shot me twice. He just came and said, pa, pa, shoot me down. There. No, man, that's not right, man. If I had a gun, I would go in life and shoot that cop through the head, man. People can talk and talk and talk. The counselor, when there's an issue within this community, she never pitch up. Mm. And one thing about her, she's a good liar. Yeah. She's an autocratic leader. We're not hooligans. We want our area and our children to prosper in this area. We are more concerned about the children. They are attending school, they're busy writing exams. They can't wash themselves. They can't, you know, attend to their schoolwork as normally being done. Service delivery is the most important aspect that we are fighting for. Everything is available, but not for us. And by meaning us, it means all the people, irrespective of your race. South Africa now has one of the biggest gaps between rich and poor in the world. Dr. Johan Berger of the Institute for Security Studies, a non-governmental think tank, believes it is this visible gap that leads to much of the violence and aggression in the country. He has been invited to talk to local government about the dangers of not dealing with the growing crisis. Many of our municipalities are in a state of paralysis and dysfunction. So there is little chance of any effective service delivery taking place. And ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you that these conditions can lead in the end to revolt, uh, revolution. Very often people smile at you when you start talking revolution, but if this thing is not brought under control, this is where we will go services are being neglected. 
Now, what this, what this is sending out, especially in the poorer communities where it's more rife at the moment, is that there is uh, there's a, a, an attitude of no care. The government doesn't care about us, doesn't care about our problems. So the message that it sends out is an absence of order, an absence of law enforcement. But more serious than that, it sends a message to the criminal. This is the area where I can operate because the authority doesn't care about, the authorities doesn't care about this, this environment. We can give up and say, okay, you know, abandon the building, abandon the area. Or we can say to ourselves, let's retake the area, let's retake this, this building and let's start in a very coordinated way, in a very interactive way and let's allocate responsibilities. Sibu Sisu Zikalala of the Alexandra Community Policing Forum holds a similar view. He wants to see living conditions in the township improved. He feels the way people live in Alex contributes to the crime and violence in the area. We're supposed to have a pavement here, isn't it? So that this is for cars and people can walk there. Now, due to the shortage of space, people have already built shacks just along the road. If police have to come here responding to a complaint, they have to walk in there. And one thing that you can realize about this is that there are no numbers in these shacks. This place is called probably um, 112 8th Avenue. So now you don't have a specific shack that this is 112 8th Avenue. All of these shacks fall under 112 8th Avenue. And so it becomes difficult even for the ambulances when they come around here um, to respond to, 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 to a complaint or a call. Sibu Sisu also believes that education is another important factor in the fight against crime. He has initiated a program to try to instill more discipline in the often unruly state-run schools in the township. Today he arrives at a school in Alex, along with other volunteers, to conduct a surprise search of the premises. What we want to do, we want to motivate the students to say that you guys, when it's time for you to go to school, you need to be at school and do what's right within the schoolyard. So that's why we are doing this as the Crime Prevention Youth Desk in Alexandra, and we, we have had good results. The campaign is not popular with all of the students. What do you say about this? What do you say about this? What do you I say about know You know about this. You cannot attend school in here and tell me that you don't know that you have learners that are carrying these things in your school. You know about this. You guys, if you are elected in leadership positions, you do what you are told to do, man. This school was almost closed because of the poor performance. So what we are saying is that we don't want to see that again. Even if they have to howl at us and do whatever that they are doing, at the end of the day, they'll do the right thing within the school yard. Personally, I believe that the education of a black child cannot be compromised anymore. Even if they want to compromise their own education, we are not going to allow them to do that. Because now um, we need to have more people that are going to be in leadership position, leading um, with proper intelligence, not just people who will make noise at the end of the day, um, seeing that they are doing nothing and they know nothing. So what we need to do is to have more people that will be educated because one of um, the reason why we, we, we have a problem with service delivery, we have a problem with the way people are responding to certain issues in our country, is because they are not educated. And multiplied by the human rate. Do you see that? Here we divide the fifth denominator, the second denominator by... In a privately run school in downtown Johannesburg, 13-year-old Tani already recognizes the importance of a good education. I am working for my future. If I'm not working for my future, I'm going to sleep in the street. To make different pictures. Okay. Here's the, what we call funny collage. Okay. I have to paste the face of the president. Okay. Yes. 
Then I look for a body that would make my picture to be very funny. So that I have a complete picture. With this uh, generation, these little kids, without education, you are rest assured that the economic challenges would force them into crime. But if they do have education, uh, at least they are able to fend for themselves. Are we ready for the president? Yes. The complete picture. <laughs> must walk the streets of Hillbrow to and from school every day. Now I don't want to live in Hebrew because uh, people they are fighting. If I'm going to school I see the blood. From peep. That's why I don't want to stay in Hebrew. In the 1960s and 70s, Hillbrow was a desirable place to live and a hotbed for intellectuals, political activists, and academics. But as people poured into Johannesburg in the early 90s, the place began to spiral out of control. Crime exploded, buildings were hijacked, and it became a no go zone for the police. Although Hillbrow still has a long way to go, it has undergone massive regeneration in the last few years, largely due to the efforts of Ikaya, a neighborhood improvement initiative spearheaded by Josie Adler. Born in Hillbrow into a family of refugees and immigrants, Josie's commitment to building strong civil society has been a lifelong career choice. While many changes have taken place, crime is still an issue and many buildings remain hijacked. For 11 years, Crest Hill was hijacked. That's Crest Hill. And uh, the people inside the building called the hijacker Hitler, I don't know if that was his name, they steal your building the same way they steal your car. Criminals can come and say to people in buildings, you can pay me less, you can pay me half. Now the uh, hijackers, they'll push your own security out and you lose control completely. The services don't get delivered. The lifts are stolen out of that 22-storey building. If you watch, you'll see people preferring to come down a 22-floor fire escape outside the building than go down the dark staircases inside. Now we have sought to build up a neighbourhood association of participant property owners who want to uh, regenerate the neighbourhood. It's not a bourgeois notion of urban regeneration. It's people who are living in hijacked buildings who also want a better life. The Matrosberg apartment block is part of the Ikaya initiative. Longtime Hillbrow resident, Sheikhs Masango, manages the property. This building it used to be a hijacked building. So before we took over here, we had to fight and get all the people out there. And it's not an easy thing, it's not an, an, an overnight something. We have put the securities all over just to make sure that everybody's happy and everybody's safe. They pay for security as well. It's also included in their rent. I lived there for 20 years. This place was very, very dangerous. You couldn't walk anywhere here. Yeah? There were no lights. People used to get robbed during the day, at night. It took us something like eight to 10 years to get this place where it is now. And we know each other now. Like, and we're just watching each other's back now. There's a community now. And then let's make this place safe. This building is one of the buildings which is still uh, hijacked. People are staying here for free. 
There's no caretaker. Nobody's taking care of this building. So if the building is like that, then it's a dangerous building. You see now, you just came in here and there's something happening upstairs. As Sheikhs arrives, he hears that one of the flats is on fire. Fires are commonplace in hijacked buildings that are not properly maintained. You can see the way it is. You can see the electricity also. The wires are just hanging like that. It's a very dangerous one. This is one of the buildings which our community also stays. And we cannot abandon them and say, no, we, we're done with our, our buildings. That one, let it stay like that. It, this building also needs to be fixed up. There's a fire, and they cannot call any fire brigade. They're busy there using some water, and they kill that fire, because they know they're here illegally. I don't know what, how these people are coping. They don't have to complain. They cannot complain, because they know this thing for free. But anyway, they know any time the bomb will go, boom, then everything will be finished. Tani lives in one of the buildings that has also joined the Akaya Neighborhood Initiative. One of the improvements Zikaya has brought to Hillbrow has been the creation of a park, a safe place for the children to play. In an effort to keep children off the streets, community coaches are running afternoon soccer clinics. <laughs> Security guards monitor the park all day and have a presence throughout the area. When you've got a society where the policing is not operative, people will not wait for that. Now there's been a lot of focus locally and from abroad on how South Africans and how in Johannesburg people are making their places safe, their areas safe. And it has been referred to as vigilantism. And how can a new democratic society be doing this? But show me another way to work this. Josie often walks the streets of Hillbrow with some of the Akaya Street security team. They check up on improvements in the area and chat to residents about their concerns. Josie has also pinpointed another site where they plan to develop a second park. These children are coming into the city to live here, to have life here, to become productive citizens here. Anything that Akaya neighborhood's doing is a part of making their lives work. Human settlement is not about infrastructure and um, bricks. It's about people. People make cities. People should have place within which they feel secure, but not place that sets up boundaries. This is a Kaya neighborhood and it stops here. And your hijack buildings, you're outside but an amoeboid extension of place based on the commonality of we're here together. Tired of being a target for criminals, the Kensington residents have started claiming back their streets one block at a time. They walk the crime hotspots together and support for the idea is growing each week. 
Following on from the, um, the crime meeting we had, um, one of the suggestions was to invite people from the community to, to do evening walks, um, just as a sign that we're not willing to be intimidated by crime. This is the fifth time we're walking, um, and we've decided we'll do this every Friday. So it's also turning into a nice community type of event. After the meeting, quite a lot of people came up to me and said, you know, we've really got to get this thing going, we've got to get out, and if you, you go, I'll, you know, we'll come along. OK, we're going to walk up here onto the copy over, down, I think it's good, up onto... We need to start making crime unacceptable. Uh, we need to stand together against crime. To, to get even. We're going to actually walk up the copy today, which is really, really great because uh, traditionally, it is, it is a part of Kensington that people don't like to go to. Um, that they're afraid they won't go there on their own. So today we're claiming the kopi. We also want to remind people of the beautiful suburb that they live in. When you walk, you meet lots of people, you, you talk to other people on the street, you hear where they're coming from, what they're doing. And definitely there's a sense of community. And I think it helps the suburb and it, hopefully it will help the crime come down as well. Patrick Murphy comes along on the walks. He's pleased to see people getting to know each other. I see people exchanging numbers, neighbours who might not even know each other, live on the same street and don't know each other. Now people are talking, asking, where are you from? So it's, it's wonderful. People must, must work together. And they must inform each other and look out for each other. Because if we don't look out for each other, who's going to look out for us? Yes, it is the responsibility of, of, of the police services, of the government to look after us, people pay their taxes, etc. But there's a responsibility on every other individual to look out for every other person in society as well, particularly the weaker members of society, those who are elderly, those who are unable to, to, to look out for themselves. So those with the skills should partake and, and give it their best shot. I'm the eternal optimist, so we always hope for the best. And I feel positive. I feel we can overcome what's out there.